Hello again. Well, we've been talking about cryptographic protocols, and in the last lecture we introduced the notion of attacks on cryptographic protocols. Let's drill down into that a little bit today. Okay, so one of the hardest things to understand about a cryptographic protocol, any cryptographic protocol, is what constitutes an attack. A, a famous person once said, a good attack is one the engineers never thought of. Um, so what does constitute an attack? What kind of questions might you want to ask? Well, first of all, uh, does the protocol really accomplish its goals? For example, are both authenticity and secrecy assured? Do the parties know that they're really talking to the people that they, they think they're talking to? Uh, are the messages being sent secure in a, in a sense of confidentiality? Um, is it possible for an attacker to impersonate one or more of the parties? So that comes back to the authenticity question. And there's an attack called man in the middle where uh, a party tries to convince each A and B that, that it's talking to the other party when it's actually talking to some third party C. Um, is it possible to interject messages from an earlier run of the protocol? So these protocols often run you know, hundreds, thousands, even millions of times. And so uh, an attacker may have message traffic from a run of the protocol yesterday or a week ago or a year ago. And if they can interject that into the flow of messages going back and forth among the parties, can that somehow you know, mess things up? That's called a replay attack. What tools can the attacker deploy? That is, what, what uh, resources are available to the attacker to uh, do his best to, to mess things up and accomplish some goal of his? Um, and then finally, if a key is compromised, what are the consequences? So you might think that this question isn't really fair because in any scenario in which you're using cryptography, you're assuming that the attacker doesn't have the key, right? But recall I just said that the protocol may run hundreds or thousands of times and there may be a new session key, for example, generated each run of the protocol. And so there's a, there's a target rich environment out there and an attacker who you know, breaks one of those keys, say, you know, out of the potential space of thousands of keys, can he then use that key to mess things up in the current run of the protocol? And that's a good question. Okay, so some of the attacks, uh, well-known attacks on protocols, well, the one we just talked about is called a known key attack. That is, if an attacker uh, breaks one of the earlier keys from run of the protocol or breaks one of the, say, public or private keys of one of the parties, can it use that to uh, accomplish some bad purpose. Uh, the replay attack can, you know, an attacker who has retained some messages from earlier runs of the protocol somehow interject those into the flow in such a way that the parties get confused or something bad happens. An impersonation attack, can somebody claim to be another party? For example, if A thinks they're talking to B but they're actually talking to C, then A may disclose information to C that it wouldn't want C to know. Uh, a man in the middle attack, we mentioned that a moment ago, uh, an attacker interposes him or herself between the two parties and pretends to each to be the other uh, and may therefore get some confidential information. And finally, an interleaving attack, you know, if you take um, messages, you know, arbitrary messages that the attacker can generate and interject those into the flow of messages between the two parties, can that cause something bad to happen? And we'll see examples of many of these later on. Okay, so in the face of all of these attacks, it's, uh, it becomes something of a challenge to design the protocol in such a way that the protocol is robust and secure, you know, despite all of these things that an attacker might be able to do. The assumption typically is that an attacker is able to access all of the traffic being sent from all of the parties within the protocol and also may have arbitrary messages stored from previous runs of the protocol and can put those together in arbitrary ways. Now, the question might be asked is can the attacker's messages that it can interject into the flow be arbitrary? And the answer to that is no, because for example, if the attacker were able to generate an arbitrary message, then there wouldn't really be any defense. 
and so, for example, we assume that the attacker can't generate uh, a message encrypted with a key that it doesn't have unless it's you know, previously grabbed that from a, a previous run of the protocol, for example. Um, and so there are some limitations on what the attacker can accomplish and what, what uh, a kind of attack it can pose. But it's hard, to, it's hard to specify exactly what those constraints are. And so what we would like to do, ideally, is to have a protocol that should be robust in the face of a determined attacker who has all of that traffic and the capability of putting it together in very clever ways. Okay, so one thing that I've said several times, but I'll reiterate, is that because of the distributed nature of these systems, protocols are highly asynchronous. And what that means is that any party to the protocol is not going to know anything about what's going on outside its own purview, except the messages that it's sent and the messages that it's received. And in particular, any party to this exchange won't even know that the protocol is occurring until it receives a message, you know, unless it happens to be the initiator of the protocol. And so what that says is that the protocol has to be designed in such a way that when a party receives a message, it, it knows what the message means and how to respond to it. Okay, so what have we said? Well, we said that one of the hardest things about analyzing any protocol is, is constraining the capabilities of the attacker or even no understanding what an attack might be because a clever attack on a, on a protocol often will be one that nobody has thought of previously. The distributed nature of the system means that most parties won't know that they're even participating in the protocol until they receive that first message. So unless you're the initiator of the protocol, you, you don't even know you're participating, so to speak, in the protocol until you get that first message. And consequently, the protocol has to be designed in such a way that when I receive that message, I understand that it's step K of protocol J and I know how to respond appropriately. Thanks.